All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, day two of the workshop. My name is Asad Masri from the University of Sydney. I'm chairing this morning's session where we have uh, quite a balanced session this morning, I guess, between uh, numerical and experimentalists. So uh, the first presentation will be given by Professor Hong Im from Kaos on the computations of uh, ammonia flames, and then it'll be followed by Professor Bo Zhu from SASTEC, uh, Southern University of Science and Technology, on experiments. So you have a full dose, I guess, this morning's session about methane, uh, about meth ammonia. So without further ado, it's over to you, uh, Hong. Okay, where is the file? Okay, is everyone seeing it? Put my screen on the corner. Okay. Yeah, good morning. Uh, so everyone on site, as well as those who are joining online. Uh, my name is Hong Im. I'm a cost and a CFD person in the CCRC group. And uh, yeah, I was, uh, well, thank you for the invitation to present in this uh, workshop. I was uh, asked to do the task of uh, summarizing some computational aspects of ammonia combustion. So I'm not going to talk about the, uh, those physical aspects of uh, characteristics of ammonia flames, which has been discussed a lot yesterday. And also I, would, I, would not, I will not talk about any general combustion modeling issues like conventional turbulent combustion modeling, flamelet, advanced you know, modeling development. Those are common to general turbulent combustion. So I'm trying to focus uh, specifically on uh, issues related to only to ammonia aspects uh, in the modeling perspectives. Uh, I asked around many of my our colleagues and uh, I got quite a bit of uh, feedback and input from the people who are listed here. So I would like to acknowledge them and uh, I will uh, introduce some of their slides one by one. So this is not intended to be entirely my work, although uh, my part of the contribution is, is a significant part, but uh, it'll be kind of a consolidated effort. I'm trying to, so again, the, in the spirit of the workshop, my objective is to open up some intriguing, some new challenges. And as a cliche goes, it, always the challenges are opportunities. So uh, what kind of interesting research topics we can come out and so that we can bring it up to uh, for a more extensive discussion. Override control. Okay, so basically it boils down to, as I survey some of the modeling issues, it boils down to three key topics and that's, I'll present it in that order. First is obviously, even if I'm gonna talk about CFD, uh, well, we rely heavily on chemistry and there was a very nice review yesterday, uh, Professor Nakamura gave a talk and so I will probably duplicate some of those issues that he brought up. But again, this is more on the uh, chemical uh, kinetics and in the context of the flame applications. And I will talk a little bit about the uh, additional aspects of uh, uh, kinetic effects on other types of the flame behavior, extinction, ignition, and even suit formation part. Uh, second topic I'm gonna cover is uh, uh, the physical model, how ammonia as a fuel impacts the way we describe the turbulent combustion, which includes the laminar flame description. And so, so there has been some work done by NUS on the flame stretch effect. And uh, I'll talk, address a little bit about this diffusive thermal instability, which is a very well-known aspects of hydrogen flames. And the, some new interesting De development. This is a brand new item that uh, will be presented at the aspect next week. So I'll have a brief discussion on that and the new way of defining the mixture fraction. And finally, not least, but uh, spray. Well, I, as, as I understand, in you know, many of the effort in Tohoku University, for example, they are looking into a direct spray injection of ammonia into the combustor. So spray dynamics will become also very important. And I would like to briefly review some of the unique aspects about ammonia sprays as opposed to conventional, uh, like a diesel engine type of applications. So that's the kind of overall uh, scope of the presentation. I'll try to 
deliver in a, within time to leave enough time for discussion. So starting with the uh, chemical kinetics, uh, this was a contribution from uh, our colleague Mani Sarati. Uh, but this particular slide is about, uh, there was uh, some extensive review survey by uh, Turani group on the uh, existing mechanism. As you can see, there are already quite a few large number of uh, mechanism dealing with ammonia combustion and that about total of 18 published recent publications have been reviewed and assess uh, their accuracy and so on. And uh, so the, well, it concluded according to that study, the best performing mechanism in general in terms of ignition and flame speed prediction turned out to be these uh, three mechanisms recently developed. Uh, but still having said that, there are a lot of things that needs to be further investigated, especially some uh, specific uh, radical species associated with the ammonia combustion process as laid out here, and they need to be uh, more further investigated. So there have been uh, work done. Uh, it, but in terms at cows, in terms of uh, validation, uh, we have done some work on non premix extinction phenomena of ammonia and blends. And some comparison has been made. So these are some examples of these are pure ammonia nitrogen against oxidized non premix flame extinction strain rate as the uh, fuel fraction increases. And you see the quality of trends pretty well. And this has been tried with various types of the fuel blends with other hydrocarbons, as well as even hydrogen. And overall, the trend was well captured by the mechanism, again, with some doubts and uncertainties. Uh, so some discrepancy, well, long story short, uh, this is not exactly my work, but uh, the conclusion was this, there are still existing discrepancies, uh, especially some important key radical species associated with the uh, ammonia oxidation, which I will elaborate in subsequent slides. So these are uh, Mani's uh, summary of a uh, key important uh, details of uh, kinetic pathways that needs to be further investigated. Uh, as you can see, the, one of the primary uh, radical species NH2, which is clearly one of the first radical uh, out of the uh, abstraction of ammonia. And then some other important uh, intermediate species, as you can see on the, on the right side. So speaking of which, there have been some actual work done by the Polymi group. This is a contribution from Alessandro Stani at Polymi. And they did some of these uh, first principle ab initio calculation and uh, mainly highlighting on, as you can imagine, we want to burn ammonia in a lean condition. And that is a main focus. And that's where the flame speed is very slow. A lot of things, uncertainties goes up. So lean and low temperature chemistry and then high pressure condition, those are the main focus of the investigating chemical reaction rate. So here are some summary, which will be elaborated in the subsequent few slides. Uh, basically one of the important uh, doors step toward the uh, subsequent oxidation uh, was uh, identified as H2NO and they conducted some of the ab initio calculation to predict those rate constants. And here's some compil compilation of uh, experimental data that is used for validation. And they also uh, found some key roles of the important uh, hydrogen abstract abstractors such as O2 and NH2. And uh, they found significant discrepancies and uh, there is uh, further work to be done. So basically this was one of the first a demonstration of the, uh, the use of this, uh, the ab initio first principle calculation uh, to demonstrate this capability of being able to predict these uh, rate constants, although there are more work to be done. So for example, as I mentioned, this H2NO, right out of this NH3 first abstraction, this is an important uh, pathway towards the subsequent major oxidation and also forming the uh, NOx species here. And that abstraction of this H out of this going into HNO is, is uh, really found to be very important. And that is one of the parts that has been uh, deeply investigated. And there are found some uh, 
uncertainties there. So again, I don't mean to give into too much of details, but again, the importance, it is important to recognize there is still a substantial amount of uncertainty that needs to be looked at. In particular, uh, the, uh, some surprising results they found was uh, the, uh, some abstraction reaction associated with common species like O2, as well as NH2, which is again, clearly one of the important uh, first radical that is produced. So those are kind of ongoing research as has recently been uh, published. Now moving into the kinetic validation in the actual flame context. This is a contribution by uh, NUS, uh, by uh, Huang Wei Zhang. So they explored a lot of uh, kinetic mechanism of available out there in terms of flame speed prediction, for example. So these are the, uh, the equivalence ratio sweep of uh, various types of experimental data compared against uh, different mechanisms. So, well, you can see, well, I think uh, it reminds me of the plot yesterday. There, the, there's uncertainty band, which is kind of getting narrowed down over time. So I think uh, we are trying to get there. So at the moment, this is a level of uncertainty we are looking at, and we want to do more work to better, you know, uh, narrow down the uh, level of uncertainties, especially if you're dealing with the, uh, the lean range where the uncertainties are even higher. And they also looked at the uh, spherical flame measurement data. And these are some three different cases of different fuel blend ratio, including the just the hydrogen air versus ammonia air and somewhere in between the 50-50 mixture uh, to find out that interestingly, the, uh, the biggest uncertainties of the me different mechanisms was revealed when there is a 50-50 blending. They were actually in better agreement in the pure ammonia and pure hydrogen, but the differences were a lot more revealed. With, so whether there is a synergistic effect, something missing, uh, that is a further subject of investigation. And uh, they also looked at a lot in the conventional context of the effects of stretch in the flame speed behavior. Uh, this type of Bunsen flame, they conducted open form simulation of uh, a Bunsen flame, which is a classical geometry to reveal the effect of curvature. And along with the flame surface area, you can observe these uh, flame speed variation, as well as the uh, Karlowitz number stretch behavior. And the uh, tentative conclusion here was that the uh, stretch sensitivity is a lot higher when it is a uh, pure ammonia, uh, but interestingly, that sensitivity is uh, reduced as you add more and more hydrogen. Uh, the, this is not looking at the pure hydrogen case at this condition, but uh, th that was a kind of interesting tentative conclusion. So again, this is an ongoing uh, research topic of uh, going back into the stretch effect, which is a classical laminar flame theory, and we need to work on it for uh, ammonia combustion. And this is uh, my group's work, and we also looked at uh, effects of ammonia blend in the soot formation behavior. So th there has been a lot of uh, experimental measurement and almost uh, consistently found out that adding ammonia to typical sooting hydrocarbon flame uh, reduces soot formation substantially, as you can see in this experimental data. So as the uh, ammonia blending increases, you can see a substantial reduction in soot behavior. However, uh, when we use the best, one of the best ammonia combustion reaction kinetics, blend it into typical hydrocarbon, combined with our, the uh, soot models that we have developed over the years, the prediction was not really good. Not just the uh, quantitative prediction of the soot mass, but also more importantly for practical devices, it's really important to capture this uh, sensitivity of as the ammonia fraction increases, uh, there is a sensitivity of the reduction of the soot, which was not well captured by the existing model. So we looked into that a little bit more carefully. And uh, again, long story short, this is what we came up with. So uh, we, in the past few years, we also developed quite a bit of uh, the improved soot nucleation inception model based on PAH, you know, the, the, dimer, the dimerization process. 
Uh, we've been relying primarily on this physical dimerization, but uh, uh, in this recent work, just to accommodate this uh, behavior we observed, we introduced so-called the reactive inception model. Uh, just to wanted to clarify that this is by no means any first principle uh, detailed reaction model, but it's a more like a simple is because to be amenable to the big uh, CFD simulation, we just try to capture it's a it's, after all it's a model, so we want to capture some reactive aspects, and then this a reversible reaction pathway on the way to the uh, dimerization into uh, pseudo inception. So that is uh, additional steps that we included. And so this dimer is a complex and there is additional some uh, abstraction reaction associated with these radical species. And that is allowed to be uh, reversible. So this additional inclusion of the reaction, reactive uh, nucleation pathway allowed us to capture this uh, experimental behavior of the soot sensitivity to ammonia addition much better than without it. So this black one is a conventional, our physical re irreversible inception model that has the cap trend that has been much better captured. So we've, and then the main idea was that by doing incorporating this, the reactive inception model, we were able to uh, capture better in terms of pH, the, the concentration was increased and that leads to the uh, reduction of the prediction of the soot. So it captures both trends closely with the experimental data, which is shown in the dots here. So that's the main story of our kind of success story. And uh, we are actually, as it turned out, we looked into this into a so-called inverse diffusion flame. I don't know if many people are familiar with it. This is a the inverse inverted jet flame configuration where you inject the oxidizer from inside and fuel from the outside, uh, which turned out to be quite an interesting flame configuration to look at soot process, which is kind of opposite way. So this was in the context of gasification uh, project. And we actually utilize this configuration quite a bit in, in looking at different chemical pathways. Again, uh, one additional uh, fine tuning we added was the impact of this uh, NH2 uh, in the in the, uh, the, uh, the additional soot interaction, which was actually developed by uh, Glarborg some years ago. And by adding those additional, the ammonia specific reaction step, we were able to improve the, the agreement even better from red to green, and this is additional NH2E reaction on top of this reactive inception model. So this, I just wanted to share this uh, recent development and that could be hopefully uh, uh, useful in the uh, ammonia pre, you know, blend effect on in the soot formation. All right, so let's switch gear to uh, turbulent flame aspects. And this is one of the typical uh, flame in the box simulation we did. So uh, one of the important, in my mind, the, as I survey the community at the moment, one of the important uh, physical aspects to be incorporated in the turbulent combustion modeling of ammonia hydrogen blend, I guess everyone would agree that inevitably because of the low reactivity in the, the practical way of burning ammonia in a premix mode would be some blend of hydrogen. So in that sense, because of the hydrogen species, the unique behavior, it reveals a lot of those uh, well-known aspects of the diffusive thermal instability. But this was uh, not about that. We just conducted a relative comparison between hydrogen and ammonia flame while matching the uh, reference laminar flame speed at the same level of turbulence. And we just wanted to see how they are different. You can even appreciate here even by just looking at the overall flame topology, about the same level of turbulence on the Borgid map, uh, you will see a whole lot larger level of wrinkles for hydrogen flame versus ammonia. And as we do the integrated burning rate enhancement in the black line, which is a total overall volumetric burning rate, hydrogen flame shows uh, over more than tenfold increase in the burning rate while the if in the equivalent ammonia flame, both lean and rich condition enhancement was much less. So that was a quite uh, surprising finding. 
so far, our explanation is the following. Uh, the, basically, the heat release rate for pure hydrogen flame is located way ahead in terms of a progress variable structure. So it is way upstream in the preheat zone, as opposed to ammonia flame where the heat release peak is sitting way back. So inevitably, when the turbulence attack the flame structure, uh, it decays be because of the density variation. So effect, even with the same inflow turbulence level, the impact of turbulence wrinkling onto the flame structure is much more intense for hydrogen flame versus ammonia counterpart. So that is a kind of qualitative insight that we wanted to share with you. And that can probably be uh, validated in the experimental studies. Now, speaking of uh, the earlier topic that I just brought up. So this other groups like uh, Heinz Peaches group as, and, and they have looked at it uh, and a number of others on this uh, effect of the hydrogen blending in ammonia flame. So as you can see, the, there's a lot of this uh, small scale wrinkle, which is well known to be the, uh, the feature of this uh, diffusive thermal instability, which is the uh, main outcome of the fast diffusing hydrogen fuel. So as it turned out, there is uh, this uh, destabilizing disp effect of the hydrogen uh, is increasing, as we can imagine, as the uh, hydrogen fraction increases, and especially when the mixture is overall lean as opposed to overall rich. Uh, these are well known, you know, is the, uh, the, the dispersion relation curve, where the higher value of the positive slope indicates larger level of diffusive thermal instability. So as you can see, uh, the, as the more hydrogen blend is added, and when the overall mixture is leaner and leaner, you see the much bigger effect of this uh, diffusive thermal instability. And it has been argued, which I personally would like to confirm myself, is that this effect is not insignificant. In fact, it can enhance the local burning rate. I'm not talking about the additional wrinkling factor, but aside from that wrinkling aspects, even the uh, surface average local laminar flame speed is enhanced by uh, several factors all the way up to an order of magnitude. So here's an another study by uh, Andy Aspen's group in uh, Newcastle. They in fact uh, conducted a whole bunch of this DNS simulation to come up with this uh, correlation to show that actually this correlation predicts this the stretch factor per se, the laminar flame speed enhancement associated with this diffusive thermal instability was even up to an order of magnitude larger. And they recently, this was an interesting study presented in an SA paper uh, on the uh, implementation of this flame stretch correlation model into the uh, engine type of simulation for hydrogen engines. So more work to be done on, again on these aspects. Speaking of engines, uh, we also have, uh, in collaboration with Saudi Aramco, we conducted some of this ammonia engine work. Uh, the uh, experimental work is done by our colleague, Jamie Turner, and we conducted some full cycle engine simulation. Uh, we were able to match some of the behavior. Uh, first of all, ammonia engine was demonstrated to work. So it's a good news. So we don't even, we're not even talking about hydrogen blend, but just pure ammonia combustion. Uh, under proper conditions in a SI mode, we were able to run it properly. So there's the, no doubt behind it, but we still wanted to, I'm talking about modeling aspect, how we, what are the new unique uh, distinct challenges associated with ammonia combustion? Uh, one of the first thing was that uh, uh, our first experience was that the uh, grid, this is an engine simulation where they converge. Uh, the uh, engineering type of simulation with much coarse grid. Uh, what we found out was the initial ignition behavior. Ignition was possible physically, experimentally. Just to capture that numerically requires a lot more uh, uh, tricky treatment of the grid resolution. So that was uh, one of the findings we had. And uh, how, am, how am I doing in time? I think, uh, I bet, yeah. Uh, and also another, the common aspects of, uh, well, those who know the converged code, 
the basic reaction uh, closure was combustion closure was done with the uh, so-called the SAGE model, which is uh, basically lamina closure. So every computational cell is considered homogeneous well-stirred reactor box. And that is not exactly the representative of the flame, flame scenario in the typical SI combustion. Mm -hmm. So we always uh, boil down to this uh, discussion about conventional SAGE versus uh, G equation approach and which we, we have successfully done it with our previous work on the pre-chamber study of uh, methane air. Uh, we repeated the same argument here. We were, first of all, uh, just like our previous methane engine, we were able to demonstrate, let me play the video here. So this is a try following through at the different phase of the combustion mode. We are tracking down the combustion regime, turbulent combustion regime on the Borgi diagram. Let me play it again. But starting from the uh, most intense turbulence condition at the point of the initial spark, most of the, during the whole duration of the combustion at this engine condition, uh, the lamina flame, flame net regime remains valid. And this is consistent with our previous findings of other uh, pre-chamber engines. So basically this further assures that the typical turbulent flame correlation like Peter's correlation model works, although the exact, uh, the, uh, the correlation constant needs to be further validated in the subsequent study. Now, this is another kind of open agenda I would like to bring up. I, I personally myself uh, am still trying to understand it a little bit better. I'll have to give a lot of credit to my student, Lorenzo, he's uh, sitting there. He really came up with this idea and I'm just uh, communicating with him to learn about it. Uh, well, as you know, the, uh, well, ammonia flame, the, we all understand the, the mixture fraction variable, conserved scalar variable as a nice way to map the combustion space. Uh, the problem with ammonia combustion is that normally nitrogen is uh, inert, but you have fuel bound nitrogen. So there is uh, some confusion going on. So this is an idea. So he came up with these two reaction pathways in the nitrogen, hydrogen blend fuel. Hydrogen is a normal, so we, don't, we have no issues there, but when it comes to nitrogen, the ammonia burning, this nitrogen burns off and produces some nitrogen there in the product. And that should be distinguished from the original nitrogen it contained in the air. So the conventional way of deciding this mixture fraction variable needs to be uh, revisited. So he came up with this uh, clever idea of uh, defining two different coupling functions, one based on ammonia, second based on hydrogen. And then, uh, well, it's, again, this is a kind of long story. He will have a presentation. I, I showed you a paper number right here. So this will be, the more detailed story will be presented on Monday in the afternoon. But just wanted to give you, throw, put it up on the table for a further consideration in the future. So basically the long story short, uh, we have two different ways of defining mixture fraction according to two different reaction pathway. And depending on the blend ratio, you can uh, choose one or the other. So the, here in this example, Z1 is associated with these uh, first, the ammonia reaction pathway. I'm sorry, let me go back. So this reaction path one and reaction path two leads to Z2. Uh, their stoichiometric mixture fraction location changes depending on the, uh, the uh, ammonia fuel fraction between ammonia hydrogen blend. And, but uh, Z1 and Z2 has different stoichiometric location. And how does it uh, reveal itself in terms of uh, actual, and uh, by the way, in terms of determining, quantifying this beta one, the first mixture fraction variable with including nitrogen uh, in ammonia, it's not easy. So you don't know in advance how much of nitrogen originated from the fuel and how much originated from the uh, air. So it, it turns out to be the computation of this mixture fraction is an iterative procedure. It's not a big deal, but you have to guess it first without nitrogen and plug it back in and ret retrieve those uh, nitrogen content, distinguish them and feed it back. 
so iteratively until you get the convergence. So that's how we do it. And here's a comparison between Z1 and Z2, and they are not the same. And depending on the, the fuel fractions of Zeldo, which the, the, is a bigger mixture fraction is our new one. So conventional Zeldovich way is a kind of classical way of defining mixture fraction. According to that, the Z1 and Z2 are different, but with our new definition, those two Zs are exactly identical. So this was a really nice way to unify the behavior in the hydrogen, nitrogen, the ammonia blend fuel system. Uh, another interesting feature here is that this is one example of the flame structure as you change the fuel blend ratio. Uh, so these are less amount of uh, hydrogen and ammonia. So there are uh, qualitative changes here, but important point is that uh, this is a hydrogen concentration across the mixture fraction coordinate. You can see, and I told you, that I gave you the numbers about stoichiometric mixture fraction. So you have two distinct points of the stoichiometric mixture fraction point, the Z1, is here, which is a consumption of the ammonia and uh, clearly hydrogen diffuses out further. So you have this a uh, double layer of the fuel consumption point where the stoichiometric uh, mixture fraction for hydrogen is located further in the lower value of the, the mixture fraction. So again, it's not clear to me how this is gonna pan out, how that's gonna change the way Gaetano presented a lot of these, um, the interpretation of the flame. I am hoping that this might change our way to interpret the flame structure analysis. So more to come on this subject. Okay, uh, let me, I think I'm doing okay. Maybe five more minutes, two minutes, okay. Uh, about spray part. So this was a contribution from Michele Battistoni at the University of Perugia. Uh, they were working on this ammonia spray in the engine context. And uh, I understand, again, Toko Group has been working in the gas turbine context. So they've done the conventional Lagrangian type of uh, spray simulation. So this is experimental data. They were able to measure the, the sort of mean diameter of the, the droplets of the ammonia spray in two different conditions. One is a flashing condition and, and normal evaporation. In all cases, the, they found that interesting finding was that the mean diameter increases with the pressure. So those are some interesting behavior of the ammonia spray, which was not quite yet properly captured by the existing spray, Lagrangian-based spray model. So they put some work on it. And these are two examples, flashing and ev regular evaporating condition. You can appreciate the general dispersion pattern. And the column map shows the temperature of the droplet. So you can clearly see the droplet cooling to associate with this evaporated cooling effect. And those are properly captured. Although when it comes to actually predicting the, the penetration length and the diameter prediction, and those required, again, this is all detailed recently published in their journal article. They found out a lot of this model constant has to be, had to be re the adjusted to capture this kind of behavior. So clearly, there's a lot of things that we don't fully understand about this uh, ammonia spray, which is characterized by large evaporative cooling effect and that uh, associated with the uh, flash boiling, which is uh, quite common. And that's the uh, important topic to discuss. I'm not gonna talk too much. This is another clever model developed by Lorenzo. Uh, we try to include this uh, breakup mod new breakup model with the uh, nucleation model associated with the nucleation bubbles will grow over time. And when it reaches certain thermodynamic condition, they are expected to burst into these, uh, the, the smaller pieces. So this is a kind of a heuristic breakup model. And then thermodynamic effects are all incorporated to capture these uh, droplet cooling effect as you have seen earlier. And then uh, one of the important issues here was that uh, this process is still fairly complex, although it's a heuristic model. So it involves a lot of different physical time scale associated with the uh, nucleation and the bubble growth and the thermal heating and so on, and then fluid dynamic time scale. So we, it, 
are working on these uh, different scenarios of depending on those time scale ratios, we may be able to determine whether this type of evaporated cool flash boiling may be important or not, depending on the, the thermodynamic condition. So I'll just uh, conclude by just showing the initial demonstration of this uh, heuristic model, which somehow you know, captures this uh, breakup behavior fairly nicely, along with this uh, droplet cooling behavior, which co is uh, consistent with the uh, recent studies by uh, Okafor and company. So I think I ran out of time. So I put back nearly the same slide with a slight uh, rephrasing of the word article. So, but again, as I said earlier, the main intention was to put up many open questions. I don't even have the clear answers yet. And this, these are some of the issues that uh, people, modeling group people are looking at in, in the context of ammonia combustion. So with that, I would like to open up for a further discussion. Thank you very much. This uh, nice overview, I guess, of the issues and challenges from uh, kinetics to uh, sprays. Uh, uh, we have time for uh, questions from the audience and also from our uh, friends online. So if there are uh, questions there, then please raise your hand or, um, or just write the question on the chat. Are we monitoring the chat? You're doing it. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. I can see the chat box here. Nobody yet. Okay. okay. There's well, one. Basam. There's one in the back too. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ong. This is um, a, a good overview. Uh, I'm trying to get my head around this uh, beta one, beta two, so the two definitions of mixture fraction and how you uh, how useful it is for the modeling modeling purposes. I mean, initially you started talking about NOx and how you could differentiate nitrogen coming from here or coming from there. But eventually you need to reconcile them and can't see an easy way to do that because as you know mixing the pressure diffusion and other aspects uh, and uh, i was also interested in uh, where you're showing that how the ammonia is disappearing early and hydrogen is sustaining itself longer and so on of course when in the measurements we did we, we don't see that you'd see it all blended or broader, if you want, distribution. I'm just trying to get my head around the yeah, concept yeah. and how it's going to be useful. Okay, well, so we are just starting to understand exactly the implication. One thing I can say, uh, though, is that uh, we were able to unify uh, Z1 and Z2 being uh, same. So it's, uh, there is no difference between the two behaviors. So that's one advantage in terms of formulation wise. And how it changes our way of viewing and interpreting the flame structure that is yet to be studied further. Lorenzo, do you have any comments from your? Uh, you need to use a microphone. Okay. I think that it really depends on the projection space because at the end of the day, Mr. Fraction is a variable that you use to define the state space of the flame. So according to you define it, you will obtain something uh, that is broader, something that is thinner. So in this case, uh, you, with uh, this kind of definition, you are able to split the two behavior, but maybe if you are using uh, as uh, everyone does now, basically uh, the Mr. Fraction based only on uh, the hydrogen stoichiometric reaction, you will obtain only one uh, critical point in the definition and so for this reason you can see only one uh, kind of peak or one point where all the fuels is going to uh, finish so this is the general idea the back. just a comment on, on this from, from the experimental point of view uh, we see exactly uh, what you uh, what you're showing that the hydrogen survives past our uh, stoichiometric mixture fraction because we're using a single definition that doesn't include the nitrogen. We see this uh, hydrogen surviving past. So uh, experimentally, we see exactly the same uh, plot. Now, does it matter or not? Okay. This is uh, to be uh, yeah, determined, but uh, we see experimentally, we measure exactly the same. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for the talks. Um, can you give your view on the uh, the MPH, the nitrogen-containing pH? How does it affect the soup formation? 
and the difficulties of the modeling, the submodeling. The, what is the pH? The pH. NPH, the uh, nitrogen containing pH. So how does it like affect the formations? Can you give your view on that? Well, so we try to add one by one some of the relevant reaction pathway and try to describe, uh, predict what was observed in the experiment. So this was an additional pathway. I didn't develop this chemical reaction rate constant and these pathways. These are some of the kinetic mechanism developers job and we try just to incorporate that. So, uh, yeah. So this, our model is still, uh, again, uh, just to recap on it. And so this is again, heuristic phenomenological model. I must emphasize it's, it, it's not by no means intended to be a rigorous first principle. We get challenged a lot by so-called the kinetic purist about even the dimerization model concept itself. We incorporated different combinations of the smaller PAHs and some people believe it is not real because there is no way that A2, A3 can contribute to the dimerization process. But then the, my argument is that, well, they, those kind of models is a problematic because if you rely on real, the dimerization only based on A4 and higher PAHs, where's the experimental data? Nobody knows how much of those are formed. So there is no way you can validate those rate constants based on experimental measure. So this was a, this is an older story that we've been arguing. We developed a more successful dimerization model and that was found to predict those trends much better. One of the important uh, things to capture in the context of turbulent combustion is the sensitivity to the strain rate because of the turbulent effect is manifested as a strain and that can change the behavior of the suit by an order of magnitude. So if you don't capture that sensitivity, it's, you know, forget it. It's, you know, won't be able to capture it. Uh, so far, not many mo suit models were able to capture that trend properly. So this was in my, well, I would like to claim that this was our, some new uh, contributions. Again, the, the, idea of configuration allowed us to look into additional aspects of this inception model. And that was a new uh, story here and associated yeah. with the ammonia. Work in progress. Uh, question about the uh, hydrogen uh, blends, the premixed, lean premixed hydrogen flames. If you can go back to that slide there. The premixed flame. The yeah. premixed, yeah, the lean ones. So you said yeah, that yeah. the hotspot, essentially the formation, the heat release rates uh, is more effective, maybe a couple of slides down, for lean mixtures uh, uh, as the, opposed to the stoichiometric ones. Is this, why is that the case? And is this true right across the premix? Lean versus domain? rich, you're talking about this. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, I don't wanna, well, I have to be careful about answering that question. I don't have any conclusive answer because, you know, this uh, turbulent parameter, you, your domain, physical domain size, as you can see, is different. Yeah. So uh, the, it's really hard to say exactly what's going on. You have to uh, increase the size of the box, domain size, uh, to be able to appreciate the impact of these large scale turbulent eddies. But having said that here, the Reynolds number range is comparable. So basically we try to match the uh, length scale ratio in terms of integral scale it is with the flame thickness. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this, mm. but, but, but that's important for the formation of hotspots. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're saying that the risk of forming hotspots is more prevalent when you're running very lean, and that's important for engine design, right? Hotspots? Yeah, well, you know, heat release rates. Yeah. He Localized heat release rates. Okay. Yeah, well, but the flame structures are similar between these two lean and rich conditions. Right. These are not the heavily rich, but it's barely 1.2 point fee of 0.8. So those slightly lean and slightly rich. The, our intention of doing this slightly rich condition is because that's where the Knox formation is the right. lowest. Has this been repeated at higher Karlovitz numbers? The Karlovitz numbers are published, you know, shown here. It's about 75 right. based on the inflow condition. We force turbulence all the way to the, the, uh, the uh, base of the flame. 
and these stop. are your calculations yeah any other questions before we move on all right well i think the timing is great so thank you very thank much you. Uh, Hong game uh, any questions from the uh, before we close from the audience from online no okay well good, good so please join with me again in thanking Hong.